Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Father, may you be praised and may you be glorified through us. For Lord, you are the most high God. And Father, we just like to thank you for all that you do for us. Father, we thank you for life and we thank you for your many blessings that you bestow upon us. And Father, that includes this time that we have right now to study your word. Father, we thank you that you have provided us with an hour each day, Lord, um, an hour in which we get to meditate, fellowship. And Father, just to um, think about your goodness. And Father, we just pray that you may bless us during this time. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit may prepare our hearts to receive your word. And so, Father, that we may be transformed by it. Father, we thank you for the gospel that is written by John, Lord, that reminds us, Father, that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that, Father, we are to be sanctified, Lord, through your word, so that we may uh, be reunited again in your kingdom. Father, we thank you for all those who are on the platform. Lord, I ask that you may bless them. May you bless the families as well, Lord. May you cover them and protect them. Father, I pray for those who may not be able to join us today. Lord, I ask that you may still be with them, Lord. And Father, I ask that you may make a way for them to join us again uh, tomorrow. Father, I pray for Brother Hugh, Lord. We thank you for all that you do through him and for him. And Lord, we just ask that you may equip him with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. May you give him wisdom. Father, may you give him strength so that he may lead the study. Father, again, we just like to thank you for this time that we have. And Lord, we ask that it may be a blessing uh, to us. We pray all this in the gracious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen. Sister Chifu, thank you very much for uh, opening our study today with prayer, as we normally do and as you do so often. We thank you for that. Yes, again, I welcome everyone to the Open Arms Seventh-day Baptist Church Daily Bible Study. And we are in the Gospel of John at chapter 14, we're at verse 21 this morning. Jesus is in the middle of this uh, upper room discourse or his farewell address. He will be leaving them shortly as a terrible ordeal that he will undergo in a matter of hours. He'll be arrested, crucified, abused, uh, and then he'll be resurrected and he will ascend back to his father. But in these last uh, remaining hours here, he gives all his attention to his disciples and he's preparing them for the time when he will be away from them, which will be very soon, something they're beginning to, to sense, and they're very distraught at this. And Jesus is preparing them, he's comforting them, he's making them some wonderful promises. And by the time we get to chapter 17, we will see that many of these promises, or most of them, if not all, that were made to the disciples on this particular night also applies to us. So these are our promises here that we'll be reading about and studying shortly. <clears throat> well, during his address, uh, he's been, um, should I say, interrupted a couple of times with questions, maybe three times already. And when we come to, when we begin our study this morning at verse 21, there will be another, another, another question for him in the next verse. We'll be looking at that. So Jesus is just speaking to the 11 true disciples, he calls them little children. He says, you are clean. And they are the ones who are to hear these instructions. And as I mentioned, uh, they also apply to us. And we noted yesterday that even in the face of what Jesus himself faced personally, his, really, his, his concern seemed to be his disciples and not even himself at this time. But such was his love for us, which is really going to reach its pinnacle when he dies in our place on the cross. And when he dies for these disciples, who he was addressing, and maybe sadly, maybe not so, given that they were just mere men, they still have visions of the kingdom in their heads. And they're not quite accepting what is the reality of the situation here that Jesus is actually about to leave them. It's very hard for him to get them to see that 
yes, the kingdom is not just yet, it is coming, but there are some things that I must, that I need to do prior to, which he has told him a number of times already, at least three times very clearly. We read those in the Gospels. He will be arrested by the Jews. He will be handed, handed over to the Gentiles. He will be abused. He will be crucified. He will rise again, again the third day. He will come to them. He will ascend to his father from whence he had come in, in the first place. But all of that seemed to have gone over their heads. Nonetheless, Jesus is very patient here with them as he seeks to console, comfort, encourage, and prepare them for what's just around the corner. All right, Brother Devante will be reading for us today, and he will be reading uh, John 14, verse 21 to 31. <clears throat> but then any questions, any thoughts, any comments, maybe from yesterday or even before? Uh, before we get into our study this morning. Okay, if you're able, please follow along as Brother Devante reads, and he will be reading John 14, verse 21 to 31. Brother Devante. Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading from the NIV. Verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the, adv the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you, loved, if you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. Verse 31. But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Amen. Amen. Amen, Brother Devante. Thank you very much for reading for us this morning. So that is a text that is before us. And I didn't mention this in the in my opening remarks. <clears throat> but Jesus also promised to send them another helper, a helper like himself, which in our text he's going to identify as the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with them forever. Uh, he is... Uh, they are to be particularly comforted by this love that he has for them. And so are we particularly in our trials. We need to keep in mind that Jesus Christ loved us and without a doubt, beyond a doubt, that we're going to read about or we know about in his crucifixion, which was the, the climactic act that demonstrated his love for us, God's love for us, among other things. So Brother Banta just read us our passage there from verse 21 to 31. We did discuss verse 21 yesterday. So starting with verse 22 here, we read Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, John, make sure we understand that. This is not the betray he's talking about here. He has already left the room. This Judas is the son of James. So read that in Luke 6, verse 16. So Judas said to him, Lord, what has happened that you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And here, this Judas is referring back to verse 19 and 21, where Jesus said he's going to come to them and he'll reveal himself to them, but not to the world. And what puzzles Judas here, and maybe all of them, as a matter of fact, is, uh, okay, so if the kingdom is coming and you're going to establish the kingdom, how is it? that the world is not going to be, they're not going to see you. How, how can that be? Of course, 
Jesus is referring here to the fact that after his resurrection, he will appear to them and not to the world, but eventually at his second coming, then everyone would see him. And we talk about this yesterday that after Jesus' resurrection, all his public appearances were, all his appearances were to his disciples only. And we can see the distinction between Jesus Christ's disciples and the world per se, or his disciples and those who reject him. But Jesus doesn't really answer the question here, you know, as we'll see in verses 22 and 23. As a matter of fact, they had asked him a similar question some time back in Matthew. In Matthew 13, Jesus was telling a series of parables with no explanation. And the crowds, by and large, didn't quite understand the message in these miracles. But later on, Jesus did explain the miracles to his disciples. <clears throat> and they sort of wondered about that. So I'm just going to read this. These are these verses here from Matthew 13, and to show that Jesus always makes a distinction. Even though he loves everyone, <clears throat> God has a general love for all people. He has a particular love for his own, those for whom he died. In Matthew 13, 10, Matthew 13, verses 10 and 11, after a series of parables and people said, or people are wondering, what does all this mean? Later on, he's explaining to the disciples, and they had this question for him. And the disciples came and said to him, Why speak thou unto them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So this is sort of a similar question here that Judas asked. Okay, how come we're going to see you in another world? Jesus doesn't answer. He had already given them sufficient information that a question like that should not really be necessary. Nonetheless, eventually all of this will become very, very clear to these disciples. So Jesus goes on here in verse 23, not really addressing Judas's question. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. We see here, and this is a reminder, we've seen this already. The proof of love for God is obedience to his word. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how you'll know that you really love me. But then he makes this very wonderful promise here, which was hard to imagine and for us. It's only because we have the Holy Spirit that we can really grasp this. If anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. And that's, that's some kind of thought because the word dwelling here is the same word Jesus used in verse 2 of the same chapter when he said he's going away to prepare a dwelling place for them. It's that same word. So the idea here is that the Father and the Son is going to dwell with us. You know, it's going to take the disciples a while to grasp that one. But of course, when on the day of Pentecost and after, they will come to understand these things. And we understand that in the sense that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And in that sense, the Father and the Son is with us. But even that, even with that explanation, it's kind of hard to, to imagine, uh, thinking maybe it's not something we think about all the time, that we have God actually with us. We might recall when Solomon built his, you know, fabulous, wonderful temple, and at that dedication, and he was praying, he wanted God to, to really make that place the, the location or the locale for his place on earth, for his dwelling place on earth. And Solomon really wondered, you know, can the God who made the heavens and the earth be actually be contained in a temple in this little building as fabulous as it was? And here we are, and the disciples were being told that the Father and I will dwell with you. And all of these are, you know, are meant to really comfort the disciples, and I'm sure it did eventually 
And we should be no less comforted this morning to know that God's Holy Spirit really is really living in us, even at this moment. Of course, you know, the, the question is, if he's living in us, is he living comfortably? Is he, can he feel relaxed living in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, or, you know, he just can't take a seat. He can't, can't relax here because of our behavior. So this thought should somehow moderate our behavior or ensure that we're living in such a fashion that the Holy Spirit can be comfortable living in us. Okay. Now Jesus gives the same statement here from the negative side in verse 24. The one who does not love me does not follow my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, it is very important that the disciples come to understand the unity, the oneness, the union between Jesus and the Father, because they had no problems with knowing who God the Father was and believing him and accepting his promises and his faithfulness and his ability to fulfill any promise he made but they needed to hold Jesus in that exact same regard. There's a father, there's me, we're of the same essence. He's God, I am God. And what I'm telling you is coming straight from him. Very important. Uh, it was really a big issue with Jesus Christ to get this across to his disciples because yes, you're the son of God, but are you God? And we've heard Peter made that confession before. And of course, even to our day, there are those who will say, oh, he's not really God. He was this, he was that, and the other, but he's not God. But Jesus is making sure his disciples understand that he is God as well. Any thought, any comment, any questions here? All right, Jesus goes on in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while remaining with you. And right on you, Yes, it's a current. Sorry to cut in again. Anytime, anytime. So close to the point. Um, thing. You know, mighty God, powerful, powerful, powerful reading this morning, powerful. Brother Hugh. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? We do. Yes, how we do. do we, how do we activate the Holy Spirit? We activate it in the Word, listening to Bible studies, communicating, prayer, and fasting. Because if Jesus is telling you that the prince of this world <laughs> is here. It is here for a purpose. Jesus' death, he died on the cross. He took our sins for a purpose as well. For us to be with him. So when we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have to activate the Holy Spirit, which is strengthening the Holy Spirit with the word, with prayer and fasting. Because if we make this flesh rule us, we're not going to see God or live with him in heaven. So this flesh has to be put under subjection. The spirit man must be the dominant one in us. Because God is telling us that we have the power to reject what the enemy is placing. We are not that weak. And why we think that we are really weak is because the flesh is the dominant one. We have to let the Holy Spirit be the dominant one to look when time these things come up. We have the fruit of the Spirit to have and say, look here, this is me. I am going to be patient. I am going to be in joy. I'm going to have peace. I am going to have mighty God. 
Hey, Brother Hugh, look here. This is a powerful thing, and we should embrace the Holy Spirit. We should be embracing the Word of God, the Bible, the raw Bible, the raw Word. And when it comes in, hey, when it busts us, we have to go repent. When it clears us up, when it gives us revelation, we have to be thankful. We have to be joyful. When he comes and tells us, look here, this is what is happening and this is what is need to be done. We need to be obedient. We cannot have a plan A and a plan B because sometimes I have a plan and it's plan A and a work. I go to plan B, plan C, go right down to Z. But with God, we have to be, look here, we have to be obedient. We have to listen. We have to really, really be the doer of the word. We have to really listen. And we, we grow. We grow in the Lord. We grow in the word. We grow in cleansing. And we are cleansing each day by the word of God. So let us just open our minds to God. Let us just open our minds to the word. Very powerful, brother. You want to have to pray for you dearly. God bless you. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Sister Karen, I thank you so much for that exhortation and the application you just made in that very powerful statement. And it's a real precise commentary on what we're reading today and what we're going to read in chapter 15. Because all of those things that you emphasize, Sister Karen, are the exact same things that Jesus is going to put before his disciples and before us this morning. And it's good that we are reading the scriptures and uh, maybe we are understanding what we read, but then there's the application and the awareness of how what we're reading should impact our lives, our daily lives and our circumstances, as you so clearly exhorted us this morning, Sister Karen, and we really, we really thank you for that. <clears throat> and, you know, we, we can't pass with all these exhortations because either yesterday or the day before, we, we read a verse that we are to believe and we are to encourage ourselves and we are to tell ourselves that we ought to believe. And this morning, the fact that the Holy Spirit is living in us must have some kind of impact. He is real. He's here. And it is to be manifest in our decisions, in our mindset, the way we respond to circumstances, as it's occurring so emphatically and clearly put it to us this morning. Sister so, so Karen, I thank you for that. <clears throat> Any other thought, comment, or questions? Good morning, Brother You. Good morning, Sister Lurie. Good morning to the rest on the platform. Brother You, if we are reading the word and living by the word and the Holy Spirit dwell within us, certain things we're not going to do because there will be a conviction on us, right? The, the devil going to tell us you to go lost after this spree. Take this man money you're working with the person you want to steal, you want this. There is a conviction that come up on us. If you're really living by the word, it's not easy sometimes, you know, because sometimes it is weak. The flesh is weak sometimes. But for you of the Lord within you, and you ask him to live within you and show his light to you, you will try in every way to do the right things and don't lose after the flesh and don't lust after people things, and don't have grudgeful in your heart, in your mind, because those things are ugly. God don't love those things, right? So we just have to live by the word and live by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That's my few words, Brother you. Sister Lord, and I thank you for that exhortation. And as I consider what you just said, Sister Lurleen, and the rest of us should be doing likewise and listen to Sister Karen's uh, exhortation as well. I can't help but feel that this morning on the platform right now, maybe many of us, we are hearing the word, we are understanding the word, but we're not really adjusting to the word. 
Hence, the Holy Spirit is bringing these exhortations here to really put the things we're learning into practice. If we have been falling for the same thing over and over, or we have been ignoring the conscience or the voice of the Holy Spirit, this is a day when these messages are coming very clearly to us. And in these two comments we have heard, we're being exhorted to let the word act, to respond to the Holy Spirit promptings as we go through this word and as it registers in our minds. You know, we have to make some changes. I think these exhortations is pointing to that very situation in our lives this morning. So Lurleen, I thank you for that. <clears throat> and there's a hand raised. Yes, Brother Hill, Sister Phoebe. You know, I just really want to um, appreciate the comments that we hear daily because they're just not comments, they're correction, they're instruction, they are um, encouragement. And um, I appreciate these daily Bible studies because, you, I, for example, I'm, I'm in a situation where my flesh wants me to respond one way. But I'm reminded by hearing the word of God that that is not what God wants me to do. And I must be obedient. I must be obedient to the word of God. And in everything, live by God's will. And, to, when, and when I live in his will, I will give, bring glory to him. But if I act in the flesh, I'm going to do the total opposite. And so I appreciate the comments from Sister Karen and Sister Lurley, you know, we all, to me, this Bible study is like a relationship because <laughs> these people can be my mother and grandmother. And it's like a correction, a spiritual correction. And so I appreciate the corrective nature of God's word for his children to bring us back onto the right track, to bring us back to where he wants us to be. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the comments that were made to, of the previous speakers. Amen, amen. And Sister Phoebe, I thank you for your comment as well. And typically, when we open our Bible studies in the mornings with prayer, and one, one constant, well, more than one, but one I'll point to right now, is that the prayer is always that the Holy Spirit will help us to, make, to apply the things we are learning to our daily lives and circumstances and all the exhortations, all the words we've heard this morning point to that very thing. So that's been underlined, brethren. So we have to we have to respond. You know, we have to really look into our hearts and see how we like how we are lining up with the word, understanding that the Holy Spirit is there to empower us to do the right thing in any situation. Yes, there are trials, there are testings, they are difficult. Some of these decisions are wrenching, but we need to make the right decision and we have the Holy Spirit to empower us to do so and to deal with these circumstances. Sister Phoebe, thank you for your comment. Any other thought here? Yes, Brother Hugh. The flesh, we want to deal with things in our own. The flesh would want to do what the flesh wants. But we have to exercise self-control, which is one of the fruit of the spirit. Sometimes, as I often said, I stop talking. I shut my mouth. Because, brother, you, as we tell you, we don't reach the tea yet, much less with the perfection. So sometimes I shut my mouth. I just let you talk. You do what you want to do. I shut my mouth. But in my mind, I said to God, I said, God, who are my mouth? God cover me under the blood. God hold me, hold me with the right hand because if you hold me with the left hand, maybe I'm going to drop it. But sometimes we have to exercise this health control. We have to let the, the peace of God reign, you know, because he give us the peace and we can't let the enemy heal it. We cannot let the enemy take it. He gives us comfort. We can't let it. I don't care what is happening. I will reserve my peace. God has given me that. And look here. Even if you come, I'm a mind straight to one or two. Dear, look at me. And, hey, you have to come back in. You have to come back in. I got you know. Hey, you have to come right back in. You, know. you have to be aligned with the word of God. So look here. 
the enemy wants to let us think that he is strong. He's not strong. God will overcome. God conquered him, you know, Jesus conquered him. We are fighting a battle that he's already win. He doesn't want us to know or he's going to think that, tell us that we are weak. God has not given us the spirit of fear this morning. But of love and of a sound mind and of power. A sound mind is to think that anything coming on my mind against the word of God. I go, hey, I'm going to plead the blood for you. I'm going, I'm going to tell you, say, look here. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, but you're not going to come and steal what God has given to me. I'm fighting for it, and I'm going to steal that for you. God bless you, brother. Amen, amen. Very strong, very strong exhortation there, Sister Karna. Direct commentary on the text we're looking at this morning, as we're going to see later on. Uh, Jesus says, I'm leaving my peace with you. You know, and that's the same thing you're talking about here, Sister Karen. And if we get to chapter 15, there's going to be a very strong message about abiding in Christ, staying with him so we can bear the fruits of righteousness. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, we have the Holy Spirit to empower us to do so. So the word this morning that's coming out, all of these comments is application. Yes, okay, so I'm understanding this now. So that is what that meant, all well and good. We want to understand, but we want to apply the things we're learning to our circumstances. And we're hearing some very strong and definite exhortations to that end this morning. So, Karen, thank you again for your comment. <clears throat> All right. Any 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 other thought or comment? You really like this? I really like the, the mood here. Okay, verses 25 and 26. And keep in mind as well that Jesus is really, he's, he's both encouraging his disciples and he's preparing them because they don't know what's coming. He, do, he knows what's coming to them and they need to be strengthened. And afterwards, they're going to have a big task ahead of them. Jesus wants them to know that they have been prepared. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will empower them as we are to be empowered this morning to be obedient, let the Holy Spirit be comfortable in our hearts. You know, we have to deal with that sin thing. We don't have to be victims. Verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while remaining with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I have, that I, I said to you. Now we can see... <laughs> Well, we know this, of course, but even just looking at the disciples in their situation right here and then, even though Jesus had emphatically told them about what would happen to him in Jerusalem, they didn't remember any of this, it seems. Just totally taken up with the kingdom and what it promised for them and their position and the prestige and all of that. The other things that Jesus said to them, totally gone. However, when the Holy Spirit, the helper we talked about yesterday, <clears throat> when he comes in the name of Jesus Christ, of course, he comes, he's going to be pointing people to Jesus. He will teach you all things and remind you of all that I have said to you. It was a very important uh, verse we're looking at here because ultimately these disciples, these 11, along with Paul and some others, they're the ones who will be writing down the teachings of Jesus Christ. These are fallible men who are going to be recording God's word. And we have those words today because of the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of these men. Jesus has been teaching them for three years. And even something that he said to them just maybe a couple of months ago, maybe even weeks, they've already forgotten. But when the Holy Spirit is, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind them of all of Jesus's teachings. He's going to super, superintend them in the recording of those things. And that is what we're reading here this morning. What John recorded and what he selected to record, that was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So yes, the Holy Spirit has that task to perform and which he did, from which we benefit this very morning. But there are also responsibilities that comes with this knowledge and this revelation that we're receiving. And we've heard some exhortation as to how to, we are to respond to that. But the Holy Spirit is our teacher. 
among other things, he's called the helper, the comforter, one who encourages, but he's also the teacher. He's a teacher in the church, and he's the one who is to be speaking. Like when we pray for our Bible studies, every voice that is heard, we want that voice to be the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what we're hearing this morning as well. Uh, John talks about this a little further in his first epistle in John 2, verse 27. I'll just read that here. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you remain in him. And we recall when Jesus first promised the Holy Spirit, one thing he told him was, he will remain with you forever. He will always be with you. I am leaving you now. You're worried about that. You're concerned. Well, when the Holy Spirit comes, each person is going to have the Holy Spirit with them forever. And we got some warnings here this morning from Sister Karen, Sister Phoebe, and Sister Lurleen. We also read that, you know, we can... We can sort of quiet the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, I can't remember the exact term that is used here, but we are not to do that. The Bible says, you know, do not uh, sort of turn down the Holy Spirit, damn his message, uh, rationalize around the things that we are being told in our hearts. And when we read the scriptures and when the applications are made, we are to respond to them this morning. Okay. Verse 27, Jesus says, uh, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as, the world, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled nor fearful. Yes, the word was do not quench the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that. Not sure who posted that. But that's what we're told. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. You know, when you quench a fire, you put the fire out, you pour water on it. And the danger is, the more we resist the Holy Spirit, is this quieter and quieter his voice becomes till eventually we are not even hearing his voice anymore. So that's a warning there for us. So Jesus tells his disciples, peace I leave with you. And if we consider, you know, a statement like that, who could make such a statement? I'm leaving my peace with you. So very often when we see the word peace, and as it is generally understood by us, it means the absence of hostility. You know, we're at peace, we're not at war anymore. But when, <clears throat> when the Jews use this term, it means something much more than just the absence of hostility. It was a blessing of well-being. The idea was, all that is good, I wish for you everything, every aspect of your life, the best. This is what this peace means. It's not just, okay, so you're not at war anymore. And of course, God is leaving you his peace, right? Jesus himself is called the Prince of Peace. That's what Isaiah calls him. Peace also is a fruit of the Spirit. When we read that list in Galatians 5 verse 22, I just remind us right here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and on. So it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, I'm leaving my peace with you. And when we have the peace of God, when we are at peace with God, then God's peace abides with us. And through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, we are at peace with him. Back in chapter 3, Verse 18, we read that those who reject Jesus Christ are already under God's condemnation. You know, so it's not any kind of neutral position that one is deciding on, uh, should I accept Jesus Christ or not? No, you have already rejected him if that's your condition and you're under his condemnation. But for his disciples, we have his peace. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, we have peace with God. And he, tell, he told his disciples, I'm leaving this with you. And we can think of Peter in a matter of hours, you know, after he says, I will, I will die, I'll give up my life for you. I will die for you. Uh, what, two hours later, 
he's denying Jesus. He's saying, I don't know him. And the man is cursing. But after the Holy Spirit comes, and this is in Acts chapter 12, James has been already martyred for the cause. Peter is arrested. He's in jail. And he's to be executed the next day. He is sleeping. The man is at peace. The angel comes to rescue Peter and he has to start to bang him in the rib to wake him up. That's the peace that God left with his disciples. That is the peace that we have because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And these disciples, later on, when they reflect on the things that Jesus said to them and they saw how things unfolded, just as he said, you can imagine how you know, that's the boost that would give to their courage and their commitment to him. We have all of that history, all that has been played out before us. We have the record we're reading this very morning. So we ought to really show that we have this peace of God. We respond to certain circumstances and certain testing as those who already have the peace of God. And of course, the Holy Spirit is there applying it to our daily life circumstances and the moments we have good and bad. Okay. Any thought, comment, question? All good right. morning, Brother You. Good day, everyone. Good um, morning, Andre. Brother You, are, do you have a, a brief second to, to express or to explain what that piece um, should look like or feel like in in a believer's life um and i have another question after that if you don't mind please okay so we heard about andre's question you know what can can we get an example of what that piece should look like you know um, what does it look like in reality this peace that we have with god and i'm i'm putting that out here on the, on the platform you know what experiences have you had? Just give us one where it was really the peace of God that came over you in a moment where you would normally... I think we heard one this morning uh, from Sister Phoebe. Uh, we're not sure what the circumstance was, but she was going to respond in a certain way, maybe in anger, maybe in retaliation, but because the Holy Spirit with, is with her and because she had the peace of God, she didn't think it was necessary to really respond in her natural way. And I'm sure, Brother Andre, you yourself have experienced this, where you have faced a situation, you're going to do something, or maybe you're saying, if it was one time, this is what I would have done. I heard a recent... Yes, yes Brother Hugh, but that could also be considered to be wisdom of God. I would have answered that way, but the wisdom of God tells me not to. So I'm trying to differentiate the difference between the peace of God, and the wisdom of God. Yeah, well, I, I, but, but Andrew, I don't know that we can totally separate those two, you know, because it's really a package we get when the Holy Spirit comes, and there are different, uh, there is overlap between the wisdom of God and the peace of God, because the wisdom of God will also give you peace. But that would be a typical situation, but Andre, and you might call it the wisdom of God, and yes, it is the wisdom of God, but the wisdom of God also, you know, enhances the peace of God, which you have. And very often, the, the way the peace of God is manifested is the prospect, something is coming, which is very unpleasant, but you're not going to panic. You're not going to run, run for the red button here. And what, what, am I gonna, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know that God is with you. And you know, one way or the other, it was going to work out in the end and you will manage you know, you will go through it. It's not that you're not going to suffer or be tested or what have you. But because God is with you, it gives you that peace. I mean, for my one one occasion I can remember <clears throat> is receiving a layoff notice. And this was almost on Christmas Eve. I got a letter. I got a phone call actually from my manager because it was a time when the employee was laying off uh, employees wholesale. And that was what the man told me. And for some reason, I was just totally calm. I couldn't even figure it out. I just kind of hung up the phone. I was lying down in bed and went back to sleep. And that really struck me as really being the peace of God. And as it turned out, 
I didn't even lose my job anyway. You know, the next, I just went to work after the Christmas holidays and New Year holidays and everything just went, just kept going. So that would be the peace of God where I didn't actually, I didn't even reason anything out. He just told me that, which at Christmas Eve, you're getting this news that should have been panic. And I was totally calm. I couldn't explain it. I was even surprised at myself. But to me, that's an example of having the peace of God where the storms are coming and it's panic time. We can think of Jesus in that boat when he was crossing the Sea of Galilee with his disciples and the storm came up and the boat was about to be overwashed and they woke him and he quieted the storm. And yes, they saw the peace of God. He was asleep in the storm and afterwards they learned that we can actually sleep in the storm because God is with us. And I'm sure this is manifested in all kinds of different ways in our various lives and, and circumstances, Brother Andre. But I think it's along those lines. That's what the peace of God looks like. Okay, so so not to take up too much time. So in in a in a in a regular person's mind, they might just say that they call that in a state of shock. So therefore your body is in shock, so it doesn't react. Right? So you went back to sleep because hey, like the news hit you so hard. I'm, I'm like, what are you gonna do? They're, they're, they're like, Go back to sleep and, and, and you know, that's just one example in a regular person's mind. Now I'm going to throw another wrench into this because I'm trying to get this fully understood. Sorry to interrupt you, but I didn't look at that. as I was not in a state of shock. I actually know what shock is. This is when you're, uh, you, you're totally disengaged from your mental faculties and it takes you a while. Like when immediately after an accident, when you hear that bang, very often you're in a state of shock. That was not the case. But go no, 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 I understand. I'm just saying that's how a, a regular person looking on would say that's what you were in, in a, in a state of shock. So we responded that way. So here's, a, here's the wrench for me. You have a teenager in your home. They're living in your home. And uh, in Jamaica, the, in, you know, old time parents would say, you don't care. You don't care about anything. And, you know, you have some people in life that for them, it's like, is that how like, it's not that they don't care. They just figure everything's going to be okay. And is that how believers, like you're working with people and, and they just seem like, doesn't matter what it is, nothing bothers them. They're just like, it's not my stuff. It's not going to be, it's not going to be any concern to me. Is that how believers should act in a sense? Is it borderline? I'm trying to understand like, you know, when, when, should you not be troubled by anything? Even when you know that you have the ability to adjust or to, you can make a difference, but you can just be like, you know what? The Lord's going to take care of it anyway. So just, just leave it alone. Nothing should bother me. I'm just trying to understand and navigate that area of peace, the wisdom, and the understanding. Because we see regular people being concerned about things or not being concerned about anything. And then a believer should act in the, in the sense of where they, they have such peace of God, where they don't, they're not troubled by it. Right? When, when, when we talk about the peace, that's, that's how I envision it. We shouldn't be, you, you will just go through something and not really realize that you, you went through it. So I'm trying to just navigate that area right there for better understanding. Okay, Brother Andre, really, thank you for that explanation there and, you know, really clarifying your question. Because it's really a state of mind we're talking about here. Plus, on top of the fact that we have the peace of God, the Bible also shows that we're to do all that is in our power to do in the meantime. So, for example, <clears throat> Abraham sent his servant to find a wife, a bride for his son. And he comes to the place he was directed to. And he goes to the well, which is where the, the women come, you know, in the evening to, to draw water. And he comes and uh, he's trying to decide, so which one of these women will it be? And he prays. And he sets up a little test, you know, for God, God, if this is one, let her do X, Y, Z. Uh, so what I'm saying, Brother Andre, even though God is with you, the things that you should do, that you normally do, that are correct and right, you do those things. Um, the Egyptian ch children, the male children were being killed in Egypt. And Moses, his mother and dad, when he was born, they decided, no, we're not going to just uh, let give our boy to be killed. They make a little little raft, a little um, uh, a basket, which... They took and they put tar in it. They made it waterproof. They hid it in the reeds. 
and they're watching. So what I'm saying is the people of God, we don't just sit back, oh, yeah, I have the peace of God, it's all good, it's going to work out. No, we're to do all the things that we should be doing that God would have us do in that situation. But in the back of our minds, we know that God is with us. I just need to do the normal, correct, proper, and right things and leave the rest to God. You know, Paul was on his missionary journey. He wanted to head north. The Holy Spirit blocked him. He didn't get an explanation. He, he knew that he's supposed to evangelize. This is okay. And the Holy Spirit is blocking me from going north. I'm going to go east. So he tried to go east. So what I'm saying here, Brother Andrew, we do not sit back and say, I have the peace of God. God is with me. I don't need to do anything. We do all that is right, proper, and correct for a Christian to do in those situations. But in our minds, we know whichever way it turns out, God is still with us. Okay, sir. Thank you for the explanation. I'm just happy that we're able to discuss stuff like this because now that we have clarified all that, it brings me directly into where we get into the most um, difficult times. So now that we know this, sometimes we're, as believers, we get, anyways, I'm going to speak for myself, we get into the 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 part that causes us to 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 sin and not to sin is where is right here as a believer you see you you with your with your eyes you're seeing where the the wrong is you're seeing where the mistake is and by trying to help or by trying to to navigate that situation you can sometimes end up sinning because it's when it's knowing when to leave something alone and when to get involved get or, or 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 be in the midst of it because sometimes you end up sitting when you're trying to help and people the human beings cause you to sin because you're trying to help them or you're trying to prevent something and this is where a lot of sinning comes in sorry um brother you can i can i make a comment please certainly pastor and brother Andrew, uh, thank you go ahead pastor yeah, I, th I, I really think it's incredible how um, we are able to navigate um, these situations and, and, and sort of look at it through um, a realistic, practical way uh, as uh, Brother Andre is, is um, trying to share. And I, and I think, Brother Hugh, I, I don't really... I know the Holy Spirit must be using you because um, to be able to respond in real time to these very difficult questions and scenarios is, is really important. Um, and I think when when you're studying the word, um, it's important to recognize as you've been teaching and as we all know that this, the things of God are spiritual. And it's hard to mesh the spiritual with the physical um, because you can't always explain the spiritual experience, particularly around peace. That's why um, it, we, we understand it to be uh, the peace that surpasses all understanding because you can't necessarily... It's, and, and so while everyone else would really panic. The natural man will panic. The man of God, like Elisha, Elisha is totally surrounded by the Syrian army. There's no panic in him because he knows that the, the, that there are more for him than the, the, the men that are against him. He had to pray for his servant's eyes to be open. So sometimes the task is not really explaining the peace, but but praying that God will open the eyes of those who don't experience it. I think that's sometimes our challenge, because we can't always explain the 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 the, the, the things. Um, but again, as Andre um, highlighted, when we have people who join our study, they're not necessarily uh, they don't know the Word of God necessarily. They don't understand Christianese. Um, so we so then we have to break it down as you're doing um so that it's palatable so that we can all receive it but 
at the end of the day, he who knows it feels it, and he who experiences it knows it. Thank you, Brother Hugh. Pastor, thank you very much. This is an excellent biblical example there. Amen. Uh, you just showed us, and I'm coming to the person with your hand up, but Brother Andre, I just want to, what we're looking at here is really a case in point. And what I'd suggest to you, or maybe even more than suggest, is that when we study the scriptures, we get insight as to how to deal with these situations. We get wisdom from the scriptures. The scriptures actually speak to just about any situation that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives, either directly or through principle. So the way we prepare for that, Brother Andre, and the way we really appropriate the peace of God is to hear the word of God and apply it to our particular situations. And I'm saying this morning that all that happens in our lives, we can find a biblical principle that will give us direction in those situations. So one way we prepare and the way we mesh the wisdom and the word of God and the peace of God is to hear what the word of God says. And of course, the Holy Spirit is here to give us understanding, clarity, and application. But Andre,